Well, we, we're here to prove to a rumor mill that we have a very special lady here for your very special birthday. Come on. Let me look around. What are you talking about? You know, we just got to You might have to say trouble for me. Thank you. 
Okay, yeah, he's back in business. And back in the day, Jim had, for you young people, Jim had a, had a religious show on in the morning for about two hours. And uh, it was called the PTL Club. Yeah. And I know you're wondering what PTL stands for. Well, they said it stood for Praise the Lord. But we all said it stood for pile the loot and pull the leg. Pull the leg and pile the loot. And so they were constantly, constantly raising money. And he went to jail uh, for, you know, scams and scheming and what like that. He had a wife named Tammy Faye. And Tammy Faye had more makeup than any five women on the planet have ever had at one time. Am I right or wrong? Am I right? She cried at every show. She cried at every show. I used to think, uh, I used to think, well, if I could just get a uh, pile on that makeup and cry a little bit, oh, maybe we could make a little more money in the church and you know, maybe we could get a fundraiser. Oh, you know, keep us on the air, please. And so anyway, so these three guys, they get to heaven at the same time, and St. Peter said, well, man, y'all coming up here in droves, and you know, uh, yeah, we're going to have to wait a little bit. So we're going to send you down to hell for just a little while. And then after, you know, when we get y'all your mansion finished up here, we'll send it for you. So they all three went down to hell. Man, it wasn't just about like 12 hours later. The devil calls up St. Peter. He said, hey, this ain't working. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still down here. It ain't working at all. Old Franklin Graham down here, he's down here preaching. He's trying to get everybody saved. You know, that's just not working out for us. Benny Hinn's healing all their burns. He's, he's a faith dealer and he's healing all the burns. And old Jim Baker's done raised enough money to air condition the place. <laughs> Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those. Is that going to be you? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your message. God, how I thank you for God with church, for the fellowship that we have, for the family uh, that we feel, the sense of family. God, I thank you for our time of worship and that we sing and special music, God, just our time together. God, I pray that you bless this church, bless the programming out in the arena, how we always pray, God, for safety, edge protection around all that's done here. 
God, how I pray that you would bless the reading of your word, bless our time of Bible study. Speak to us from your word tonight. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Our text records two resurrection appearances of the risen Savior, of which there are many. He appears to the eleven minus Thomas on the very first Sunday. He appears to the eleven minus Thomas. And then he comforts and he commissions his disciples. The next Sunday he appears to the eleven, including Thomas, the following week. And uh, what we want to look at tonight is what did he say to them? Jesus was clear. He was concise. He spoke to his disciples. His words to them were their marching orders. And get this, also our marching orders. And so we want to bless you. We want to hear what Jesus said to them. We want to hear what did he say. And so there's three words that are very, very important to us tonight. Three different things that Jesus offers them. Uh, first off, he tells them to get on with it. He offers them comfort. He offers them comfort and basically is saying, get on with it. I want you to know that God is the God of second chances. And before that even gets off my lips, I want to say, and third, and fourth, and fifth, and, and on and on, you know. He gives us opportunity after opportunity. And our text is, a, is an absolute uh, guarantee of that. It's an example of that. In John 14, he's leaving. He's the one leaving. He's the one dying. He's the one taking on the sins of the world. And yet it is He who comforts them. Let not your hearts be troubled. He didn't sit down in the midst of them and say, Woe is me, you guys hug up on me and love me here for a little while. He didn't do that. He, he loved up on them and He offered them comfort. He, he's the one facing scourging and crucifixion. And yet He comforts them. It's just like Jesus and so when he comes into the room, uh, the Bible makes it clear that the doors were shut. And you can't miss that. You just can't miss that. You can't miss that the resurrected Jesus got from one place to another in unusual ways. And you say, well, what kind of? Well, I just figured when he got ready to be somewhere, he was there. Amen. It didn't matter if the doors were open or shut. It didn't matter if there was walls or windows. It didn't matter. When Jesus got ready to be there, he was there. You can hear the woo woo. You know, I mean, it's just an unusual thing here. And uh, so, you know, that immediately makes you want to think, well, it was like a ghost, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not so much, you know, because he ate food and, and, you know, and did all these physical kind of things. He said, here, touch my hands. Here, touch my side. There was something physical right there, a physical body. And yet, he could come and go and was gone and he was here. It was just some really, really cool stuff. So anyway, he gets in their midst and he tells them, you know, don't be afraid, fear not. And that was always the way that he rolled, was it not? You know, when he was walking on the water, uh, you know, it, it, it was, you know, it was something that was very scary to them. You ever been on the water at night? It can get kind of spooky, can you? You can get yourself spooked if you're not careful. You know, I can tell you right now, I was on the Nan Creek one time. And this was way back under a long, long time ago. There was a movie that just come out called The Legend of Bobby Cruz. <laughs> That's where Bigfoot was born. All right? So me and my cousin, we are trotlining down the Nanny Creek. And so here we are on the Nanny Creek on top of the, on the finger of Toledo Bend Lake, and we're fishing, and, and we're sitting there sitting down at the trot line, and all of a sudden we hear some jumping around, some bushes rattling out there in the woods. And, you know, we thought, well, it's a possum or it's a king or something. Well, after just a second or two, it got, it, you know, we understood. No, it's something bigger than that. It's something bigger than that. And then one of us, I don't remember which one of us was dumb enough to joke around about Bigfoot. But, you know, the next thing I know, that thing got plum serious. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And when we were trying to stay, we had a Montgomery Ward. None of y'all know nothing like that. Yeah. Montgomery yeah. Ward, nine. 0.6 engine on that little 14 foot homemade uh, uh, fiberglass boat. And boy, man, I tell you, that thing would not start, man. I tell you, y'all pulled and pulled and pulled. That thing would not start. Next thing you know, man, we got paddles, buddy. And I was telling you, man, we could have been on the Yale Yacht Club. I mean, we, we had made a weight going down the Nan Creek, man. I mean, we, we was escaping Bigfoot. We was getting on out of there. So you can imagine the Sea of Galilee, 150 foot deep. 
Even if you know where the stumps are, you can't walk on it. <laughs> so here they are, man. And they see Jesus walking on the water. He knows just like him. Don't be afraid. That's what he said to him first. He said, don't be afraid. I even think, I even think that the, uh, the angels' message to the shepherds in the field, I think they were coached on that. Now, when I get to heaven, I'll find out, or you can find out, and tell me, stay here, you idiot. That was so dumb. Uh, but, you know, I really think that before Jesus got there and became that little one or two cell, you know, uh, fetus there in Mary's womb, before he did that, he told them angels, hey, now look, when you break up them shepherds down there in that field, you be sure to tell them don't be afraid. Well, when them angels got out there in that field, went to dancing around, singing up in the sky and all that, the book says something to me that's funny, especially with King Jimmy. It says, and they were S-O-R-E. They were sore afraid. Now, if you ain't never been sore afraid, you ain't as chicken as I am. And I know what sore afraid looks like, you know. That's when your knees are knocking together so bad they get sore, amen. And your teeth are chattering. I mean, you're just scared to death, you know. And them boys was out there, they were scared to death. What did the angels say? Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which will be all people. You know, one time uh, somebody... I heard somebody say, and that's why you got to do your own checking. I heard somebody say there was 365 fear knots in the Bible. And boy, I preached that for years. You know what? It's not true. It only says it a little over a hundred times. So there's not one for every day, but there's a, can we call it a passel? There's a whole passel of them, right? Of times in the Bible when it says, don't be afraid. So Jesus, the resurrected Lord, uh, he's coming up into that situation knowing that he's going to scare them half to death. And he tells them, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In verse 19, peace be with you. Verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, peace to you. Now I want you to think about what he could have said. He could have walked into that place and said, Really? Hey, chumps, cowards, bunch of yellow cowards. What well, he could have said, Really? And you say, Wow, nobody would say that. I might would. <laughs> you know, what, 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 what happened, fellas? What about talking to us, room about, I'll die for you, I'll die. What, what happened with all that? Hey, Pete, huh? What's up, dude? <coughs> what what happened with all that? You know? He could have said, Wow, well, uh, hey, and, and you know, how come you guys look shocked? Did I not tell you that I was gonna rise on the third day? And you know, don't you want if you ever get a few minutes with one of them boys, don't you want to say, Hey look, man, I respect you so much, you're so audacious and awesome. Did you not hear him when he said he was gonna rise on the third day? And why would you camped out at the tomb? Amen? Amen. You do do it? Yeah. You know, it's like major pain. Hey, who's that down me now? <laughs> What's wrong with these boys? I mean, come on, man. you got to be kidding me. You know, and he could have said all kinds of stuff. Or he could have even took like a fatherly approach and just, you know, boys, I'm so disappointed in y'all. I mean, he's counting on this ragtag crew to win the world. They needed a kick in the behind. You know? He could have pumped them up. He could have ninja chopped every one of them in the throat and said, boys, look, you got to do better than this and we're not going to make it. <laughs> only the writer, only, only the writer, John himself, was present at the crucifixion and they didn't even believe him. And yet he walks into that room like it's going to be all right. He walks into that, you know, I say he walks, he appears into that room and tells them, hey, man, let's, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. He comforts them. He gives them strength. He lets them know that they have other opportunities. If anybody uh, knows this, it's Simon Peter. Because listen to this. In Mark chapter 16, it says this. Verse 5. Entering the tomb, they, the women, saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. He spooked them. His angel. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. By the way, they've got that written on the inside of the empty tomb today. And then he said this, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see him 
as he said to you. No doubt, Jesus knew that poor Peter, you know, he hears that I'm risen, and he hears I'm beating the boys up in Galilee, he's going to think he's not anybody. He's going to think, oh wow, I, I, I just dishonored him so bad. I was so cowardly. I denied the Lord. I swore up and down. Not once, not twice, but three times that I didn't even know him. You know, he said, he don't want me to come. Go tell my disciples and Pete. Make sure Pete knows he's got a special invite to see me in Galilee. What a Savior. What a Savior. How many times has it been in your life? Go tell my disciples and Steve. Steve, I still love you. Steve, I, you know, here's you another chance. Here's you another opportunity. Another opportunity for me to use you. You might say, I'm no good and he doesn't want me. But you're wrong. He does. He wants you just like you are and he wants to use you. Yes, Jesus tells them, you know, get on with it. And he offers them comfort. A second thing, I would say, get her done. I, I loved old Larry the Cable Guy. Wasn't he crazy? You know, for years and years, I used that little line, you know, when I'd say something stupid in church. Pretty regular. <laughs> and I'd say, bless them pigmies down there in South Union. Lord forgive me for that. Bless them pigmies down there in South Union. Was that funny or what, man? And, you know, him talking about grandma and all that stuff. Oh, my goodness, that was funny. And, uh, you know, and so these boys, he had that saying, you know, get her done. I've got a uh, pillow, you know, they give you a pillow. Ain't much of a consolation, is it, Tim? When they do that, when they do that heart surgery on you, they give you a red heart-shaped pillow. And all my friends and family wrote, "You're done, you're done, you're done." And I, you know, it was so much fun to have that. Well, I see Jesus; He offers them a commission, and it's a get her done type commission. Listen to verse 21: As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Did you know that is a major theme in the Gospel of John? Over and over again, he talks about he's the one who sent me. Listen to my favorite verse, John 5, 24, that we use so often to talk to people about salvation. Whoever hears my message and believes it and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Amen. Amen. Never ever be condemned for his sins. He's already passed from death into life. And so over and over again, Jesus said, the Father has sent me. I'm the one who's been sent. And now he's telling them, just like Dad sent me, I'm sending you. We are the sent ones. He has sent us out to do his work. And he says to them in verse 22, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is not an unusual teaching, nor is it difficult, and it's not a problem text. It is so very simple what Jesus is saying. Here. First off, when he tells them, uh, he breathed on them, and he said he gave them, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. You got to know that in their language, the word wind, breathe, and spirit are all one word called pneuma. It's the word we get pneumatic guns, you know, air guns, pneumatic. You know. That's the word we get pneumonia. It's the same word we, you know, it has to do with wind, pneuma. And so the pneuma is the breath, the wind, the Holy Spirit. That's like when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he was talking about the wind. All of this was the pneuma. And so he gives to them the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit fills their lives and and you know, these guys, he, you know, later on they come in the upper room and they, they all receive the Holy Spirit. And so this whole thing is him giving them the power that they need to accomplish whatever he has called them to do. So he doesn't just give them a commission and say, win the world and say, all right, do best you can. You know, he gave them the means and the wherewithal and the power to get it done. I want to tell you something that, that I know firsthand. That I know experientially. I know this from experience. I know this firsthand. Just like y'all you, you, know stuff about horses and cows, right? You know, there's just things that you know because you know it. Well, I've been a pastor a long time. And the last three churches that we've been at have grown tremendously. And I can tell you, I can tell you for a fact, the growth that the New Testament church had was miraculous. You say, what are you talking about? I'm telling you 
You can't go around and witness to enough people to grow a church as fast as they can. Right. There is no way them people worked a hundred times harder than me. There's no way. And you say, wow, that's cocky. I said a hundred times. I say twice as hard. They didn't outwork me a hundredfold. And I'm telling you, you can't grow a church as fast as they did. What happened was the Holy Spirit got a hold of them. What happened was there was all kinds of audacious and awesome. And they did it without cars. And they did it without television. They did it without cell phones. And they did it without Facebook. They did it without any kind of you know, way to get a hold of each other. You'll see me when you'll see me is how they had to talk to each other. If you want us to be connected, you got to follow me, right? You know, if you let me get over the horizon, you might not ever see me again. And so the whole thing was an amazing thing. By the end of the first century, and I know these are way apart from each other, don't matter which number it is, or somewhere in between, somewhere between 100,000 and a million Christians by the end of the first century. And I am telling you, that ain't possible without God putting His hand on it and making it happen. Amen. They had a commission. They had a commission. I want you to go out and to impact your world. I want you to go out and I want you to make disciples. I want you to get her done. In Matthew 16, 19. Oh, by the way, when He says, and the sins that you forgive will be forgiven, the ones you retain will be retained. Unless we rewrite the Bible against everything that, that we know about it, everything that it teaches, what he's saying to them simply is the same thing that he said in Matthew 16. I give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Simply put, here is the gospel. Here is the good news. Share it and people live. Amen. Don't share it and they won't live. That's the antithesis of Calvinism, by the way. So God just picks and chooses whoever for whatever and then just to prove he's the boss. No. Our witnessing makes a difference. Amen. And people, people getting saved, that makes a difference. Yeah. And so here he is with them and he's telling them, hey, you get out there and share this word and people will have life. You don't share it, then their sins are going to be retained. And so it's a very strict, it's a commission that's telling you, I need you to win the world and it's important. People's lives are in the balance. People's souls are eternal and they're in the balance. And they're depending on you to be faithful to get her done and to do this commission that I've asked you to do. That's the same thing for us. We need to get her done. We need to share Jesus. Our testimony is important. Our invitation to somebody to come to church might be the one thing that they need to hear the gospel and to get saved. What we do matters. What our influence is upon people. We need to get her done. Third and finally, he's telling them, basically Thomas, get over it. Get over it, son. Get over it and move on. Here's what Thomas said. You know, and we've talked about Thomas. I don't know if he's got a better, you know, we tried to give him a better nickname, remember? We said, you know, he's called Doubting Thomas. Maybe I'll be red named Thomas. You know, because he said what he was thinking, what was on his mind. You typically don't have to guess what a redneck's thinking. Amen? And I like that, don't you? Say what you mean. You mean what you say, Dad Gummit. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print, I won't believe my eyes. I'll have to touch it. And put my hand in his side, I will not believe you know what the problem was, don't you? He missed church. Uh-oh. 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 You know, people think it don't matter if you go or not. It does. Amen. You know, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it pretty strong. <coughs> if it don't make a difference, you ought not go to that church. Amen. 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 If you can miss church and not miss nothing, you need to find another church. Amen. I ain't trying to talk you into coming to mine. You probably hate mine. I'm just telling you, man, if you can go to church and miss church and then life is the same, you ain't getting what you need at church. 
Amen. 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 You know, when you get to church, you ought to get something that you need. You ought to be fed. You ought to be powered up. Something ought to be different than when you don't go. <laughs> hey, look, man. I, here's what I want to tell you, man. I want to tell you. You know, we, we need Thomas missed church that week, and because he missed church, he missed Jesus. Right. A lot of times, that's exactly what happened. But don't you want to give him the credit? He didn't miss the next Sunday, did he? He heard something was going on, and he was there. And if he, I, shame on me, I missed last week. If he shows up again, I'll be there. You know, I'm open to the possibility. I'm open to the opportunity. He didn't believe his buddies when they told him all about it. So Thomas goes, and by the way, Thomas goes from a willingness to lay down his life. Remember up at Bethel Bar when he said, when they came to tell him about Lazarus and they were all said, don't go, don't go. What did Thomas say? He said, let's go. Let's go and die with him. Here he goes from I'm ready to die for him until I ain't even, you know, even going to be around to see if he's around. That ain't good. That ain't good. And so he was there that second Sunday. And as Jesus walks in, he turns to Thomas. And he offers him proof. He said, here you go, Thomas. Check this out. <laughs> do, you, do you read that Thomas went up there and checked it out? <laughs> no. He fell to the ground. And he said, my Lord and my God. My kyrios, my theos. My Lord and my God. Oh, wow. He knew. And wow, his life, wow. It, it was never the same. You know, the legend has it that he died as a martyr. Uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells him something that's so important. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's the beatitude of belief. Joyful, happy are those who believe without seeing. Is it true? Amen. Amen. I believe it is. Amen. And so he's telling them, you need to pay it forward. You need to pass it on. Get on with it. Get her done. Get over it. Move on and do what Jesus has asked you to do. We're out of time of invitation. If you're here tonight and you never received God's free gift of eternal life, I want to invite you to come. I want you to move just like Thomas. From unbelief to believe. To trust in Jesus. Maybe here tonight you want to come to the altar and pray. We believe in that. Maybe you'd like to come part of our church. We'd love to have you. Let's all stand together. Let's all stand together. What can I say, man?